So good, thank good. you for taking the time to speak to the CUSP. I'd like to start by asking you, you, you read chemistry at university, you're a scientist by training, and I think in uh, you were working for the Mars Confectionery Company as, as a chemist. How, did, how was it that, it became, that you became the uh, first British astronaut and visit the Mir space station? <laughs> Yeah, it's a bit a bit weird, really, because, um, yes, you, I didn't grow up expecting to be an astronaut. You know, there was no chance in Britain to be an astronaut when I was a kid. Um, and yes, I had a, a great job, actually, I was uh, using science um, my, my chemistry and, and other bits of science and technology and engineering, working in lovely teams of people, you know, really interesting people um, making ice cream. I was on the team that um, developed the first ice cream chocolate bar, the Mars bar ice cream. And um, yeah, that was great. And then I ended up in the chocolate department. Um, so a fabulous job um, was not thinking about leaving. Uh, and yet suddenly um, there was this brand new opportunity. I actually heard about it as an announcement on the car radio driving home from work one evening. And this was an opportunity for, yeah, it was a mission that was basically creating, I suppose, the first British astronaut. And it was going to be a collaboration between the UK and what was in the Soviet Union. Um, and yeah, the announcement described some basic criteria, which was to have a science or engineering type of um, education um, to do a practical job with our hands because we had to be sort of manually dexterous to be able to um not just operate the spacecraft but do some of the experiments and to be reasonably fit and I think uh, the right kind of age they wanted a sort of a fairly young age range between 21 and 40 years old and I thought yeah you know yeah that will be a fabulous job but they'll never choose me <laughs> and you know I so nearly didn't apply for that because I assumed that you know, to be a, an astronaut, especially the first British astronaut, that, that person was going to be military and a pilot and, you know, sort of rough and tough kind of um, a, a kind of person. And, um, yeah, not like me, basically. But, of course, you know, they were looking for somebody who could do experiments in space, who could speak some foreign languages because we had to learn to speak Russian pretty quickly. And, um, yeah, and, 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 and the science background was something that I had. Um, I like to think some of my music was a was a, a bit of a deciding factor, certainly in the manually dexterous bit. So I play piano and that was a nice, um, I like to think that that, that's, that helped um, at least in some way, because it's nice when you can bring in different aspects of your life um, into to one one occupation, I suppose. But no, I was very very fortunate, and uh, and there were so I, I was selected after I think thirteen thousand people applied for that job. So um, that there was a, a rather sort of um, intense selection process. Um, but yeah, I went off to the Soviet Union to Star City near Moscow to do my training. So yeah, fabulous time. I was going to ask you what there were an incredible number of applicants. There must have been over thirteen thousand from what I was reading. What what do you think made them? Why, why do you think they chose you? So I think there's um, clearly they wanted the, 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 somebody to be able to understand Russian fairly quickly and to be able to speak in Russian because all the training was going to be done in Russian. So there was some sort of linguistic or language sort of uh, you know. Uh, uh, um, what's the word? So some aptitude, let's say, to to learn new languages. Um, but I think that a large part of it, although I didn't realise at the time, was going to be around teamwork, about getting on with different people, about how we could ad adapt to new situations, not just in space, but of course in the training as well. Because if you think back, this was 1989 when I started my training. Now, many people won't remember 1989, but it was before we had mobile phones, as we do now, before we had the internet, as we do now. So even basic emails weren't in existence. So, you know, just to make a telephone call to communicate with the British management team, I had to book that a few days in advance with a Russian operator. So it was a very isolating experience in many respects, um, probably more so than many of us experienced in the COVID lockdowns. Um, ironically, but there I was sort of, you know, just, just in a very different part of the world, um, not really understanding what was going on to start with. Um, yeah, um, but it was, that was part of the fun for me because I've always enjoyed foreign languages and learning um, learning sort of different cultures and how different cultures communicate. So of course, there's not a lot more than just the language. And um, yeah, the part, I think part of the attraction was learning to speak Russian and and becoming fluent in a language. I'd never had that opportunity before. I just dabbled, I suppose, in, in different languages. So, yes, yeah, so I enjoyed the whole experience. Um, I used to go to the, the theatre in Moscow. I used to go to loads of concerts, a lot of classical music. Um, that, that was, you know, 
really um, inexpensive, readily available. Um, Muscovites used to go along en famille, you know, and um, on their own and, you know, all sorts of people would just, um, you know, rock up to these concerts that were were, were all over the place. It was just a, f- a fabulous time, really, for um, for me to enjoy that that culture. You mentioned uh, uh, dexterity. Uh, is that something that came up explicitly in the uh, uh, selection process or... Yeah, the, um, the, the there were certain tests that we had to do, you know, sort of p- trying to pick up little small objects and place them in other small objects and you know, ma- manipulation and stuff. And it was really just to to, to see how we could um, manoeuvre stuff with our fingers. And op- operating in a spacesuit glove is not easy, especially if your spacesuit is inflated. Let's say you lose the air inside your spacecraft and then you have to inflate your spacesuit with oxygen. And that means you're it's a bit like working inside a great big balloon it's kind of fitting your body but still the the fingers are uh, sort of a, a blown up so to to maneuver your hands um and also then that, that that's tough i suppose physically tough but then later on um when you can take your spacesuit off and doing the experiments themselves some of them were quite small and fiddly let's say um operating parts of the spacecraft as, as well so yeah they they really did specifically test for manual dexterity could i ask you about your background of music uh here you play the piano and the saxophone is this something you started as an early age how seriously did you pursue it well um uh, um looking back it was all very amateurishly and it was very you know as a kid i've uh, there was always a piano around in the home and uh and i desperately desperately wanted to learn to play so um yeah I've, i think probably relatively early um i started with lessons probably six years old something like that um uh, and, and really enjoyed it, uh, and and would would sometimes perhaps be over fanatical about it, and um, uh, perhaps a bit obsessive sometimes. It was my release, I suppose, and I could I still do find playing the piano one of those. You know, if you can find a piece that you can play relatively easily, but not too easy, it takes enough of your brain power to concentrate on doing it. But then you've got the rest of your brain, the sort of the subconscious that can just. I suppose it's, it's a bit like meditation, isn't it? It's or it's um, it, it, the rest of your brain can get on and sort stuff out. It's I find that quite a restful kind of way. Uh, it's a relaxing thing to do. Um, but yes, I so I, I learned piano uh, as a kid, but just the way that you know, so many children learn to play, you know, with the, sort of stamping out the keys and going through a few grades and doing the scales and stuff. Um, I don't think, to be quite honest, I was ever going to be. A, a, a concert musician or um uh, or, or you know a professional musician at all i don't think i have a real flair for it but it did at least give me a bit of an understanding of how music is you know a bit of the theory as well and so um it's music has always been something that i've enjoyed and i say the piano is a nice relaxing thing and i suppose the for me i felt as though because i'd been trained to play what was on the music in front of me i was never really that that musician that i can just sort of you know hear hear a tune and pick it out and then add some harmonies myself um I always wanted to have that little bit of um uh, more freedom I suppose the fluidity of playing and um and I f- naively thought if I picked up the saxophone then that that I would automatically be able to ad lib <laughs> which of course is, uh, isn't the case it's not the, the instrument it's the person isn't it but there we go um but th- that's why I said I took up the saxophone um but yes it, it was just something really something a bit different something I always wanted to do and my parents could never afford for me to have sax lessons as well as piano lessons so I had to choose so yeah so when I was finally able to afford to get myself a saxophone in adult life that was one of the first things I treated myself to could I ask you what your taste in music is generally? What do you listen to? What do you like listening to? Oh, uh, honestly, I, I, I'll listen to almost anything except I suppose what, what I like is something that's um, nicely harmonious. Um, uh, doesn't it could be disharmony, I suppose, but it, 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 I, um, it doesn't necessarily have to be a tune for me. Um, um, I like it can just be a progression of chords, I suppose, and different key changes. Um, I like variations of pitch so I think organ music is a particular love so I you know the really deep notes and then that lovely piercing high top notes um and with all the the contrast that an you know a big organ can produce as well all those different tones um so I suppose that would be my you know I'm in seventh heaven if I can go and listen to some sort of um good orchestra with an organ being played as well that's my most most favorite but but yeah I'll, I'll 
in terms of stuff that you might call non-classical, um, you know, whether or not it's modern or, or older, um, just uh, honestly, almost almost anything. I'm mean, in fact I'm so out of modern, very modern music. I just wouldn't know sort of all the different genres to describe. Um, but as long as it's not too aggressive, um, I'm not into what I call shouty music. <laughs> Did you, and this may seem a very simple question, uh, a very ignorant question, did you did you listen to music when you were training or when you were actually in space? Or is oh, that something which is impossible? Absolutely. No, no, it's, um, uh, I mean, I'd taken with me a whole load of um, CDs. In fact, I was able to take my, my music player um, which, of course, in those days was a sort of a, a, a cube of, of, of some reasonable size. But um, but yeah, I'd taken a whole load of CDs with me. Um, so and, and a whole, you know, I think probably my, my whole collection then, which would have been a, a range from classical to um, rock, pop um, and a, a bit of jazz as well. And um, so, yes, I would just I would play all sorts in, in training. My commander actually um, particularly liked one particular uh, one. Um, uh, one CD and one a couple of tracks on them. So there was um, Tanita Tikaram had um, uh, released her album. Um, I don't know what it was called now, but there were a couple of tracks on there that, um, because of her voice as well, it's that, that sort of lovely, deep kind of sort of soft but almost sultry, yeah, love, lovely tones in her voice. And my commander didn't understand the words, but but he just really, really liked her, her the sound of her voice. And so I was able to take some tracks with me into space, and I took a couple of hers. Um, into space with me and so yeah again with a whole different variety of stuff and I just recorded some relatively easy listening stuff that everybody would enjoy hearing and that I could leave behind um, in space later on um, but things that meant something to us so apart from Tanita Tikram for my commander I took um, you know some uh, I think there was um, a bit of Tchaikovsky because there was one Christmas when um, a few of us had gone into Moscow to to watch a ballet, and so I took some some Tchaikovsky music to remind us of, of that particular um, event and so on. But uh, but yeah, it's actually coming back, returning from space. So I had to leave my crew, my commander and engineer, behind in space, and I returned to Earth with the crew who we'd met when when I arrived on the space station. So if you sort of mean there are three of us in a rocket um, or on the top of the, the top of the rocket in a spacecraft. Um, when I got to the space station, there were already two people there who had been there for six months. And I returned to Earth with those two people. So I left my commander and my engineer behind. Um, and as we were departing from the space station and our little spacecraft was getting further and further away, um, to start with, we were talking over the radio with each other, space station to spacecraft. And then um, when we got so far apart, really, our voices started breaking up and we couldn't really make out what we were saying anymore. And so my commander decided, you know what, he said, I'm going to say goodbye and I'm just going to put on some music to say goodbye to. And of course, he put on Tanita Tikaram. And because, you know, although it, the sound was still breaking up, you know, when you know the kind of music, you know what the music is, you can expect it. So it's more easy to, to understand than following a new conversation. Um, and so that was the last thing I heard from the space station was Tanita Tikram. But the track he chose to end on was The World Outside Your Window. I thought, yeah, he, he got no idea what the words meant, which made it even more sort of poignant, really. So, yeah, that was lovely. So, yeah, music's always been quite, you know, it, it, it's, it's just to all of us, isn't it? It's, it's what it means to us as well as how it sounds. You know, it's um, it's it's like a smell. You, you, hear, a, you hear a piece of music and it takes you back instantly to a particular point in time, something that you were doing, the person you were with. Just purely out of interest, is that can you play music whenever you want, or is there, are there only sort of specific a lot of times where you're allowed to entertain yourself? Oh um, no, you you so. I guess nowadays, because they have their own little sort of music systems for themselves, um, probably they can play whenever they want, unless there's a particular experiment that requires them to have silence in their ears for whatever reason, um, or perhaps there's other, other sounds going on in their ears that they need to be concentrating on. Um, but then the only way we could really play it um, was broadcasting it <laughs> um, just, just out to everybody. Now, you can't really listen well in space because you've got a, there's a lot of noise going on the fans that circulate the air um constantly because you don't get convection in orbit you know the, the air is apparently weightless so there's no reason for warm air to rise and if you don't artificially circulate the air you can actually suffocate in your own breath you build up more and more carbon dioxide around your face 
And um, uh, so not a good idea, obviously. Um, so we circulate the air with fans, um, which is fine, except it is noisy. I mean, you, you have to shout to make yourselves heard, even sort of over a metre or two distance. So, uh, yeah, uh, making any music would be interesting, let's say. You can't really just turn the fans off to say, oh, you know, do you, you don't mind suffocating for a bit, do you, while I listen to a bit of music? Um, so, um, so, so yeah, then it, it, it was just, just, I suppose, less pleasant than getting into a nice quiet room and just really appreciating that bit of music. But it was just, you know, it was just something, something for us to enjoy. You didn't have any musical instruments there when you went. I know, oh, I know no, people had... Oh, you did? Yeah, did we had... Well, I didn't take any up with me, but already on board station, there was a small keyboard about... It would have been about an octave and a half, something like that. So a little, little keyboard so we could pick out a, pick out a kind of tune, let's say, and um, and a full-size guitar. Um, it's a standard, I suppose, Russian fare. You know, it's a typical... Well, most most countries, certainly, if you've got a keyboard and a, and a, a guitar, most people can somehow get by with, with making some music. Um, so, yeah, um, and we did... Um, I, I don't play guitar. Um, I, I had a little strum while I was up there, but um, just, just, just for fun, because it was there, I almost couldn't not. But, yeah, I played the keyboard a little bit. Um, yeah, it's, it's obviously not a piano. Do you remember what but... you played? Oh no, I don't. Um, because because I would have been pretty rubbish, and it was just a you know such a small thing. <laughs> it's just picking out some notes, really. Um, but yeah, it was it's it's nice because you can then you can sing, and it becomes a bit of a, a communal thing. Um, yeah, but yeah, people do take all sorts of instruments, don't they? I mean, you, um, there's even been bagpipes <laughs> in space. Um, yeah, Katie Common took her flute. Um, she famously played with Jethro Tull live while she was in space. Um, yeah, people have taken all sorts. A, a sort of a slight tangent there. Do you think there are any uh, personality traits or skills? I know you mentioned dexterity, which which have been helpful both in your life as a scientist and as as an astronaut, and uh, which relate to your musical skills. Um, all I can not not specifically. I mean, all I can think of is that I mean, a lot of scientists do play an instrument, um, and. It's I don't know how anecdotal it is, but I've heard that typically scientists tend to go more for those in the so the the instruments which give you a lot of those sort of intervals. So the strings where you're thinking about intervals all the time as you're playing piano, where you're thinking again about sort of melody and multiple notes, um, less so generally than um, sort of brass and woodwind. But that's not to say you know, everybody doesn't appreciate everything, I suppose. Um, but I think I don't know if it's because it's, it's just a sort of a bit more of a creative outlet for the other side of, um, of you know, the, the rigours of science, um, or if it really is just a sort of the way that scientists' minds work and scientists and musicians um, sort of work in a similar way, possibly. I mean, it's, it's long been recognised, hasn't it, that music and maths um, sort of subjects work quite quite well together. Um, but I just, for me, it's always been, a, I, I love the idea that science is part of life. It's not separate. It's not something to be learned at school and then forgotten about in real life. And I think if we can, the more we can combine uh, science and music, science and art, whatever it is, the, the, the more that we're able to um, to appreciate, um, I think, life as a whole. And we don't you know, think about music as being you know, something that you've got to learn and then, then you get on with the rest of your life. Music is part of our lives. It's, it's Whether we're creating it or listening to it, or whether we get relaxation from it or excitement from it or both, and science is just the same. And I think anything where music and science have been integrated just really, um, you know, really interests me, I suppose. Um, so, so when I heard about Steve Thompson and Alarm um, 1201 and uh, 1201, I guess you call it, um, it's it, it just makes me much more... Um, appreciative, I suppose, of, of of one side of life when you can bring in another, and um, and people who are um, getting inspiration for their music from science, and sometimes now vice versa as well. It just really, um, yeah, I, th I think it's it's great to have that as a as a form of communication. And if we can get young people interested in science through music, um, all the better. Which brings me to what what do you think is the role of music in in public engagement and science outreach? Is that something you've you've engaged with yourself or you intend to? I've always tried, if I'm sort of um, talking to audiences, to, to bring in other aspects of life to a, a presentation on science. Um, so, yes, I, I used to 
remember one particular, I did a, le a Christmas lecture series for the University of Sheffield, um, bringing schools um, over two or three days. And, um, and, and I'd always try and um, integrate some form of music. I did one, for instance, on um, glass with um, one of the uh, academics who was um, uh, into glass technology. And uh, we made sure that we had some glass rods that we could play a bit like a xylophone kind of thing. So we could play some Christmas carols on, on these glass rods, just as a for instance. Um, and and I, I, I like that. I like that just bring, bringing different elements um, into play. So, yeah, so whether we, we bring in music into science or science into music, and there's um, a number of projects that, um, that are happening at the moment that I'm, I'm aware of um, where sort of the science has inspired the music to such a great degree that it actually now is becoming much more um, part and parcel, one, one and the same thing. And I just love that um, where children can, well, all sorts of people really, can I think appreciate one through the other and we don't close ourselves off. So we don't close ourselves off from science to appreciate music and vice versa. It's, um, yeah, it's just, just one and the same thing and, and to be enjoyed as well as learned. It's lovely. Um, now you've collaborated with uh, 1201 Alarm. Uh, you play play the piano on one of their new tracks, their new album to be released, which is called Moonshot. I was wondering if you'd tell me what how the collaboration came about. Yes, yeah, so, uh, so Steve Thompson from 1201 Alarm um, contacted me, which was great, and and uh, we can I can't remember uh, how it happened to start with. I think I I mentioned that I played piano. Um, to him, just as a sort of a, uh, we'd, we'd our paths had come across at um, at a charity event some some years before, and um, and he was then um, coming towards the end of him uh, of, of composing for this particular album called Moonshot, uh, and he asked me if I'd like to play on one track, and he offered to compose a track for me. I thought, wow, you know, nobody's ever done that for me. I never had a piece of music that composed for me. And I said, oh, that was I know, absolutely amazing. Um, I said, my piano is, mm, um, I don't play every day. Um, and my hands aren't like, as, they're not concert pianist hands, right? I can stretch an octave and a note, just, but I wouldn't want to stretch more than that. So, you know, he was able to compose some music that was my kind of ability, um, as well as physical, <laughs> you know, I could actually reach the reach the notes and everything. Um, he sent it to me. Um, I practiced and practiced, um, learned it. Um, he sent me all the timings and everything. And then um, I turned up and, and we recorded it. So in, in a studio, um, there was um, a bass there as well and drums. Um, and separately, he'd got some um, uh, some orchestration um, that he was uh, working with. And so he built up the, the track like that. And um, yeah, just just it was just such a, an education for me to be part of um, a... Um, what I'd call a sort of a modern musical um, uh, sort of recording. So rather than just everybody coming together and playing your piece at the same time and recording it as a whole, just just appreciating that sort of the musicianship of, of each of the musicians, but also of Steve and how he builds 1201 Alarms, um, sort of the, build, builds the tracks up. Um, and it was, yeah, it's lovely. So, of course, I just, when I was practicing just the piano, I could just hear the dong, 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 my, my piano bits. Um, and then in the studio, I was hearing a bit more. Um, and then the whole thing coming together um, just blows me away how, um, you know, I think, my goodness, you can actually make me sound quite nice. <laughs> so, yeah, it's yeah, just, just, I loved it. Um, and it's just nice for me as well to do something that's just out of my normal everyday. Um, yeah, we all like doing something a bit different every now and again, don't we? Could you tell us about the track? Is it uh, uh, is it purely instrumental, and is it inspired by space travel, or? So yes, it's purely instrumental. Um, it's sort of um, it's called Ozone Three. So it's about um, uh, Ozone Three was my call sign um, in in the spacecraft um, for the radio, and so it's um, it sort of starts off sort of gently with just a bit of piano, and then um, and then it builds it to more instruments, add and add. The bass is lovely on it, and um, and the, and then he just builds up, builds and builds with strings and other instruments, and so you've got lots of excitement stuff going on. It's a bit bit. I saw. I mean, I would class it as something like um. Um, sort of gentle jazz, possibly soft jazz, something like that. But it does harmonise so nicely. It's got some lovely clear notes in there as well. That that kind of that crystal clarity that I think of as sort of space kind of music, where you get uh, sort of little tings of the stars out there that are just pinpoints in space. They're not 
flickering lights or anything. They're just constant dots of light. So, yeah, it's, it makes me feel a bit like I'm in space, I guess. But it's, it does feel a little bit like it's a kind of a, a journey starting. You're getting all that training going on. You get into space. It's fantastic. Um, and then you're leaving it all behind again at the end. Yeah, that's lovely. I think they, they're sending their first album up with the next uh, Lunar Lander. Is that right? I'm not... Yeah, so Hello World... This. Yeah, the Hello World album has um, has been, um, as I understand it, has been uploaded onto the Peregrine lander, the um, the um, spacecraft that's due to go off to the moon at the moment. I think the um, the earliest launch date is uh, is December the twenty fourth, Christmas Eve. Um, so it could go up on the Christmas Eve um, and be actually on the moon in the early part of next year. If not, then there's a few other launch dates where um where they, they can also send it up. So yeah, that's the uh, that's the idea. And uh, yeah, Steve says um so twelve oh one alarms. Um, Hello World will be the first album on the moon. Um, I don't know how people will possibly listen to it while they're there, but it is a nice thought that perhaps one day somebody might be able to somehow access the music digitally and and listen to something that was recorded on Earth and sent off on on this lander. So yeah, that's quite rather nice, isn't it? What? Why is it being sent to the moon? Is is it's it's for is to sort of stay there or for someone think, to find it? Or <laughs> I think to be quite honest, it's it's a just a rather nice thing. So NASA was sending the lander to to add a a, a chip that's got some information um, from different. I suppose it's bringing making people aware that the lander who are say if you're into music you might not otherwise um, pay much attention to a lunar lander. Um, but of course, if you know that an album's going off to the moon. I think uh, there are other uh, other music as well that's also been uploaded uh, and possibly other forms of art. I mean, I, um, I yeah, that would be interesting to find out what else is on this chip. Um, but yeah, it's rather, rather nice, isn't it, that uh, an, an album can um, can be uploaded onto a uh, onto a spacecraft and, and, and off it goes. So yeah, one day possibly somebody will be able to access that and uh, and ponder um, this this music that was composed. And it, all of Twelve One Alarms music is really about um, takes inspiration from science. And Steve's got a particular interest in space, and um, uh, a lot of his video includes um, sort of space footage. Even I think some of the um, some of the tracks have got some. Um, uh, some of the original radios of the, the the voices that were um were, were happening beside the the um, recordings from mission control going up to apollo 11 that kind of thing so yeah he's uh, he's always tried to integrate science and human endeavor as well it's um it it, it inspires him um and um yeah it helps him create his music which is just just great to listen to anyway and um and it's it's a nice again it's it's just making those links which i think is always quite fun I remember from when I was younger being interested, knowing that the uh, Voyager one and two golden plates had, uh, amongst other things, some music recorded on them. Which is, uh, and 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 I've read that you've said that probably aliens around in no uncertain terms. I'm not sure if you're talking about intelligent life or whether you think it just says travels uh, in principle at least possible. Um, would you? send music if you knew, knew your transmissions could be uh, uh, received by someone would you send up send music to somehow convey uh, complexity of human emotion what well, that's would a you thought choose? isn't it yes because of course um the truth is the more i hear the more i learn i suppose about different cultures the more one understands that um, what is significant to one culture is not necessarily um, doesn't mean the same kind of thing. So, you know, we, we we grow up with a kind of a certain music, the certain tonalities of our voices, and perhaps nature influences that as well to a certain extent. Um, so I think it is, it's just because it's meaningful to me doesn't mean to say that some other life form would also find it meaningful. However, you're right, it's um, it conveys something more than um, than we can convey by our DNA or um uh, or our mathematics not that those aren't also useful forms of communication um just like the human voice is just like um you know um written text is but again you know who would be able to read written text would and would would anybody be able to understand what we're saying in the human voice would they even appreciate that you know, we might be talking in a nice kind way or we might be quite aggressive or something would they appreciate the the difference in our voice and similarly with music would they appreciate that it was sent with 
peaceful thoughts in mind. I don't know. So it's quite a responsibility, really, isn't it? Um, but yes, I'm sure it, it's, it's a good thing to do because you're right. It conveys so it just conveys that bit more than we could otherwise convey. That's why we've got music in the first place, isn't it? If you were transmitting it, would you transmit something complicated, something very simple? Oh, hmm. that's a thought, isn't it? Um, I suppose I just want to transmit something because I just don't know how it would be appreciated. Um, I suppose you have to transmit something that's got a bit of everything. So perhaps something that um, does have some very simple tune bits um, that somehow might build something that's got some nice harmonies so that you can perhaps detect a lot of other things so that the other people can understand that we've um yeah we we do like to um to listen to more than just a single um pitch at any one time um yeah so i thought i've, I've never been asked that question before so i shall, I shall yeah no doubt um start to think about that now. <laughs> Helen Sharma, thank you very much for taking time to speak to the cusp <laughs> thank you it's been my pleasure Hi everyone, thanks for watching. If you'd like to see more of the same, then feel free to hit subscribe on our channel or for more similar coverage, visit our website at www.thecuspmagazine.com. Thanks, and I'll see you another time.